Welcome to our service here at St. Mark's Presbyterian Church. I'd like to greet all of you, members, friends, and visitors uh, onto this channel. So I'm glad you are here to join us as we worship together. Uh, our COVID numbers are a little dicey. They're slowly creeping back up again. So I just want to reiterate all of the, the health guidance, the safety protocols. Uh, Please, for you and your family, let's continue to be careful uh, as the fall season is coming. Uh, I understand that the fall and winter is always worse than the summer. Uh, so let's continue to really be vigilant and careful, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of those around us. Uh, I think many of you have seen the images this past week of the desperate people of Afghanistan, uh, many, many of whom want to leave uh, because they don't want to live under the oppressive regime of the Taliban. Uh, and so it's, it was really difficult to, to watch uh, what's been going on. And so whatever your politics, whatever your politics, as Christians, as people called by God, we are commanded to love and accept everyone, near and far, particularly those who don't look like us. And so let's, let's offer ourselves to God to be the best that we are. So let's open our hearts, let's allow God's Spirit to continue to transform us, to cleanse us, to infill us, and fill us with grace and fill us with the Spirit. Let's worship God as a community and in solidarity and in truth today. Friends, let's come together now for our responsive call to worship. What a blessing it is to be in a dwelling place for God. The refreshing springs of God's love welcomes and restores us. God draws near the strong and the brokenhearted. There is a place here for everyone. 
No one is turned away. God redeems the life of all people. None who take refuge in God is cast aside. All are welcome in God's house. Praise be to God. Amen. Let's join in our first hymn, number 497, Word of God Across the Ages. Let's come together now in spirit as we pray before God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, your presence gives us strength for each day. Your hope empowers our spirits and your word provides us with the guidance we need. Oh God, help us at this time to focus on the love you have revealed. Send your spirit upon us and fill our minds with thoughts of your good provision and sustenance in your son Jesus as the bread of life. For your profound gift, we praise your most holy name and offer you our deepest thanks. May we truly praise you and show forth your light to all whom we encounter this day and in all the days to come. Gracious and merciful Lord, you have offered to us food for the journey. You remind us that your very life will sustain us as we witness to your love. But sometimes we neglect your word. We make excuses for not living the kind of life that you would have us live. We cast aside your call to be loving towards others. Forgive us, merciful God. Help us to examine the many ways in which we have not served you well and the callous things we have done to others. Cleanse our spirits and our souls from these unrighteous things and cause us to follow you more closely. Remind us again that you are the bread of life, having given yourself for us. Sustain us and encourage us in our service. 
These things we ask in Jesus' name as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Know that God's love is poured on you, in you, and through you to others. Rest assured in God's presence and love for you that will never fail or abandon you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, you are restored, healed, and forgiven. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Good morning. Uh, we'll read together the responsive psalm, Psalm 34, verses 15 to 22. The eyes of God are on those who do justice. And God's ears are open to their cry. The face of God is turned against evildoers to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. But the just cry out, and God hears and rescues them from all their troubles. God is close to the brokenhearted. And saves those whose spirits are crushed. Many are the afflictions of the just. But God delivers them from all their troubles. God protects their very bones. And not one of them will be broken. Evil brings death to the wicked. And the haters of justice will be condemned. God redeems the lives of the faithful. And none who take refuge in God will be condemned. The New Testament lesson is coming from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 56 to 69. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as living Abba God sent me, and I live because of Abba God, so those who feed on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue of Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the chosen one ascend to where he was before? The spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray them. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by Abba God. From this time, many of his disciples broke away and no longer followed him. Jesus then asked the 12, are you going to leave me too? Simon Peter answered him, Rabbi, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. We've been following John's gospel story of Jesus and the crowds and his teaching on the bread of life. And so today marks the climax of that story. Jesus tells his followers that if they abide in him, if they eat him, abide in him, live with him, in him, then he will always be with them and they will have 
true life. Douglas Webster wrote a provocative book entitled Selling Jesus. He described the church as taking a foolish route to attract an audience, specifically the practice of selling Jesus, treating him like a commodity to be marketed and bought by the soul. And they do this to try to appeal to the masses by giving them a comfortable, convenient, and appealing spiritual message. And Webster says, when we do that, then we sell out. We sell out as Christians. When we look at this whole thing purely in a consumerism way, and there's a real danger of having the market demand a lower price to move the goods, so to speak, to make it an easy sell. How do we make it an easy sell? How do we make our message an easy sell? On the contrary, in the Gospels, we read how Jesus avoids the compromises of consumerism in his commitment to truth, to follow God's way. He brings an authentic message of God's love and grace without compromising its integrity or level of difficulty in accepting the message. The only clear thing about Jesus' message the only clear thing was that it was for everybody. It was for everybody. It was an inclusive proclamation of God's love directed inclusively to all people. God so loved the world. But clear, clear message doesn't mean easy. Sometimes we confuse the two. Clear doesn't mean easy. Neither does it mean one size fits all. Jesus' message knocks on the door of our hearts in different ways, different tones, different shades, different intensity, all depending on who we are, how we got here, our past wounds, our experience, and so on. He speaks personally and uniquely to each of us just as we are. Jesus never made the comfortable feel more comfortable. On the contrary, whatever comfort we may be experiencing is sometimes ripped away from us. That's just what we have seen in the gospel stories over and over again. And so maybe we need to be shaken out of our comfort zone. But for the downtrodden and hurting and marginalized and disenfranchised, no matter who they are, no matter what their past, Jesus always uplifts, affirms, and empowers. We're all different. Jesus is committed to reaching us directly and uniquely and in personal ways that we each can hear in our own unique way. And as we see in the story, this commitment has some repercussions. He drove away, he drove away would-be disciples. We read how many disciples turned away and no longer followed him after he told them to leave if they had the wrong idea of who he was and what his mission was to be or if they, had, if they had different intentions 
for his ministry. Remember, they tried to compel him to be king. They tried to take him and make him king by force. And it says, while many, while many left him, some stayed committed to him and his mission, namely the 12, 12 disciples. These are quite opposite reactions to Jesus. Many abandoned him, and some remained faithful. And we get the idea that most abandoned him. Most walked away after hearing Jesus. That was their response. That was how they responded to a hard teaching. The question for us this morning is, How will we respond? Will we embrace the hard truths of Jesus, truly listen to his directives and follow in his way, or will we be be offended and turn away? Those among the crowd considered it and made their choice. When many began to walk away from Jesus, he never urged them to change their minds and stay. He didn't do that. If their own motives for following him in the first place were unfulfilled, why should Jesus beg them to stay? So he turned to the others and wondered if they too were going to leave. Peter stepped forward and said, Jesus, it's you who have the words of eternal life. Who else are we supposed to go to? We now know who you are. The Jewish translation quotes Peter The Jewish translation Bible quotes Peter as saying, you have the words of eternal life. We have trusted and we know that you are the Holy One of God. It's an interesting little difference. We have trusted and we know that you are the Holy One of God. And as a result, the 12 were compelled to follow him. They made that decision. What about us? When the message gets difficult, when the teachings become hard, how will we respond to Jesus' hard teaching? Is there anything stirring in our hearts that compels us to follow Jesus? Are we compelled or are we repelled? Jesus' message made the crowd grumble. Grumbling again. Now, grumbling isn't new when it comes to people's response to God's ways. We read of grumbling throughout Scripture. After the Israelites were let out of Egypt, they grumbled. They were rescued, and yet they grumbled and complained about the difficulties of their current life and their misfortune, how miserable it was out in the desert. And God was greatly displeased by this. It says in Numbers 14, 27, how long will this wicked generation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. And now the same response is given to Jesus. They grumble, they complain about his hard teachings. But Jesus refuses to tickle their ears. He doesn't give in. And this irritates the people even more. And they say, we will not tolerate such teaching. This is crazy. We will leave unless you change 
your tune. Jesus' sayings are called hard, difficult. The Greek word for hard is scleros. And from that word, uh, we get sclerosis. Sclerosis is a hardening. It's a hardening which hinders proper function. So it's not that Jesus' words are difficult to understand, necessarily. It's that they're hard to absorb. It's hard to hear, hard to accept. Why is that? His words come across as harsh. They're harsh to soft, comfortable sensibilities. They take offense. Jesus' teachings are hard teachings. Not hard to understand, but hard on our pride. It's hard to accept. The term watershed refers to a division in a river or stream where the river is split into two distinct paths that will not intersect again. The two paths are irreversibly marked. Now this section of the book of John is described by many Bible scholars as a watershed. It's a watershed moment. People will choose which way they're going to go and continue to go. Living as Jesus' disciples, as guided by the truth, or simply walking away, going into the other direction. One noted theologian, F.F. F. Bruce, said what they wanted, what the people wanted, Jesus would not give. What he offered, they would not receive. They wanted easy, convenient words, something that made them feel comfortable, a comfortable message that would bolster their self-esteem and justify their life, desires, and self-interests. They didn't want a challenge. Jesus wouldn't give that. Jesus wouldn't give in to their demands. Instead, he offered a message that would bring us to full dependence on God's grace through the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't try to persuade or compel unwilling disciples into staying with him. Nor did he try to make things easier to make it so that they would stay. He wants eager followers who understand the cost of following him. Peter spoke boldly, and courageously, and faithfully for the other 12 disciples with his words, you have the word of eternal life. We have trusted and we know that you are the Holy One of God. This helps us realize that Jesus is the key to true life, the promised gift that comes from God. Do you embrace this message? Will you follow Jesus or turn back because of offense. The picture that this story in John's Gospel paints, it's not a pretty one. It's not something that we hear all the time, people turning away. But it's certainly a realistic one. That sometimes our Christian walk of faith is demanding and difficult because it calls us to change, to change our ways, to truly accept 
God's ways for us. And that's a high calling. It's a high cost. But in answering this high call, it produces in and for us love, joy, peace, hope, community, and eternal life. And so this picture is also one of trust and faith and leads us to the recognition truly that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, you call us to the truth of life found in Jesus Christ. This challenge can be difficult because it invites us to live, think, and behave differently and in abidance with your spirit. But by your grace, you walk with us. Grant that we keep in step with you and embrace all your blessings and provisions to truly live. Amen. As we reflect on Jesus' call to each one of us to follow, to take him in, to eat and drink of him, we can be assured of God's love and presence with us and for us always. And so with that conviction, let's continue our worship in the singing of hymn 551, Bread of the World.
Let's pray together. God of all creation, we give you thanks for the summer, which brings time to reflect, periods of hard work, as well as respite days to regather our strength. Thank you for life unfolding with many blessings. Help us embrace this newness after months of isolation. You hold the future in your hands, O oh God, and we are grateful we can trust that you will walk with us in the days ahead. And so we pray for those who work in essential services. We know that their work keeps us safe and healthy, maintaining services and resources that we depend on. Encourage them, O oh God, and give them all perseverance to meet the different challenges that they face. We pray for those who lead and those who form policy and keep order in this country and around the world. Make them alert to the temptations of their office so that power is not abused and that justice is maintained fairly without discrimination. Let us be sources of your blessing and healing to those whom we know and all others who are made known to us. And so we pray for Florence Hines. May she remain in your loving embrace and presence. We pray for Kathy Ho. Grant her the sustenance in your spirit that she needs for daily living. We lift up Julie Hogg, bless her walk with you, O God, and continue to strengthen her in the journey. We pray for Marion Hauser. May your holy provisions be sufficient for her by faith. We pray for Brenda Howard. You have made known your love and grace to keep her uplifted and empowered by your will. Gracious God, as we have received, free us to give. As we have been loved, open us to love others. As we have known peace, let us serve as peacemakers. As we have been freed, Use us to work for freedom with justice for all. These are gifts of your reign taking shape among us. So we give all thanks and praise through Christ Jesus who gives us food for life. Amen. And now we come to the time of giving. You may have given already. If you haven't done so, uh, you can come to the front of our church website, stmarkstoronto.org, and uh, you'll be able to make a donation through that donation button. And so we continue to give thanks for your generosity and your continuing support. Giving in joy and love is the hallmark of Christian faith as a worship to God. And so we bring what we have to share, praying that God's generosity will multiply the fruit we have gathered to support those in need and the work of God near and far. Let us give. Let's pray together. God of growth and goodness, 
We offer what we have to share, knowing that many around us in our communities and around the world hunger and thirst in many ways. So bless what we bring this day and use it to spread seeds of hope and well-being among those who face an uncertain future. Make us generous neighbors to all in need for the sake of Christ, the bread of life. Amen. And as we close, let's sing together our final hymn, number 508, Your Word, O God, Awoke the Uncreated. Jesus comes to us offering healing and hope. Receive him this day. Go into this world confident in God's love and healing power. Go in peace 
and may God's love and peace always be with you. Amen.